All right, let's pull back the curtain on SpaceX today. Imagine having a VIP pass to one of the most secretive uh, game-changing companies on Earth. That's kind of the access we're taking you on as we dive deep into Starlink. We're not just here to talk about rockets, though. We're peeling back the layers on their, well, mind-boggling manufacturing muscle and a new pretty groundbreaking laser strategy that could fundamentally redefine how everything connects up there in space. Our deep dive today isn't just about the what, but really the why behind Starlink's astonishing production numbers and this new mini laser tech they're talking about. We're trying to cut through the noise, you know? Show you how these developments aren't just cool engineering feats, but really strategic plays. Plays poised to fundamentally rewire space communication. Yeah, and what's truly fascinating here is that we're looking at more than just uh, sophisticated production lines. We're really witnessing the birth of an entirely new infrastructure layer in space. It's driven by this unprecedented manufacturing scale and some really innovative connectivity ideas. This deep dive, I think, will reveal how SpaceX isn't just building another satellite constellation, but potentially an entire in-space ecosystem, like a digital backbone for, well, for the cosmos. Okay, so let's start with the sheer scale then, because that really underpins this whole vision, right? You need a lot of satellites for a global network, yeah. and for that, you need some serious factory power. So our first stop is Redmond, Washington. This place is churning out Starlink satellites at an astonishing clip. We're talking about approximately 70 satellites per week. 70. Yeah. Think about that. That's almost 10 satellites rolling off the line every single day. I mean, I can barely make my coffee consistently every day. What does that level of production actually mean for them? Well, that incredible throughput reflects what SpaceX internally calls a factory as a product approach. It's a strategy they've really honed across all their programs, actually. The goal is to dramatically compress build cycles and, maybe more importantly, significantly reduce costs. The footage we've seen shows this highly standardized, almost automotive-style assembly line, from you know individual component builds all the way to final packaging. So it isn't just about building satellites, it's about industrializing space hardware production, really driving down that unit cost, making each generation cheaper and faster to get up there. And the focus right now primarily seems to be on the V2 mini generation satellites. Those are absolutely crucial for their current deployment rate on Falcon 9. Makes sense. But the satellites are only one half of this equation, right? I mean, what good is a signal from space if you can't actually get it down to Earth efficiently? Which brings us to Bastrop, Texas, near Austin. That's where SpaceX is tackling the ground segment, producing the user terminals, those, you know, iconic kits that bring Starlink Internet into homes and businesses. And here, the numbers are even bigger. Oh, indeed. We're talking roughly 15,000 kits per day. 15,000. Per day. Which works out to about 70,000 per week. Wow. Yeah. And what's truly remarkable, I think, is that this Bastrop plant ramped up from basically zero to that 70,000 kits per week figure in under two years. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's still expanding its footprint down there. The site showcases really impressive vertical integration. You see raw inputs like, say, plastics and aluminum going in one end, mm -hmm. and finished package kits coming out the other ready for customers. This integrated stack controlling everything for the raw materials to the final product, it's absolutely key to their speed and, crucially, their cost control. Getting these terminals out quickly to a rapidly growing customer base. They're building the whole thing, you know, space segment, ground segment, all at a scale that's, well, it's challenging for anyone else to even contemplate matching right now. The pace is just astounding, both space and ground. Okay, but now this is where it gets, I think, potentially truly transformative. SpaceX has unveiled this new compact intersatellite mini laser terminal. Can you break that down for us? What is it? And critically, why does it matter beyond just the Starlink network itself? Right. So this mini laser is essentially an optical crosslink package, but it's designed specifically to connect third-party spacecraft, so non-SpaceX satellites and even space stations, directly into the existing Starlink network. SpaceX's VP of Starlink Engineering confirmed it's already been flight tested. Performance target is around uh, 25 gigabits per second for the links. 25 gigabits. Yeah, over distances up to about 4,000 kilometers. This isn't just a small tweak. It's a capability that fundamentally opens up a whole new set of possibilities for how things talk to each other in space. Okay, wait. So Starlink satellites already use optical links, the laser links, to communicate with each other, right? That's how their mesh network functions, bouncing data around the globe without hitting the ground constantly. What's the fundamental difference here? How does this mini laser go beyond that internal capability? Precisely. 
you're right, the internal laser links have been operational for a while. That's key to Starlink's low latency. The real game changer, the differentiator with this mini laser, is that it adds a standardized interface specifically for non-Starlink nodes. Think of it like an external port, an open yeah. connection point on the network. Ah. And SpaceX has been signaling since uh, 2024 that they plan to actually sell or license this laser link technology commercially. Now, this is a rare step for them. They usually keep tech pretty close to the chest. This deliberate opening up could transform Starlink. It moves them from being just an internet service provider, an ISP, to potentially becoming an in-space backbone provider, essentially an internet carrier layer above Earth, capable of connecting multiple different constellations. Right. Imagine any satellite, maybe from OneWeb, or Amazon Kuiper, or even a government agency, being able to just plug into this high-speed global network, almost like plugging into the terrestrial internet backbone. That really does shift the paradigm. It's like they're building the, I don't know, the interspace highway system for everyone else's traffic. And okay, connecting back to the factories, these high production rates for satellites and the terminals, they obviously feed directly into SpaceX's really ambitious launch cadence. How does the current factory rate, that 70 satellites, Rick, align with their deployments, especially with all the recent talk about Starship? Yeah, it aligns perfectly right now. The, the roughly 70 satellites per week rate in Redmond matches up almost exactly with SpaceX's frequent Starlink deployments using Falcon 9. This is what keeps the constellation refreshed, replenishes older satellites, and densifies the network using those V2 minis. But there's also a very significant forward-looking element here. It's probably not a coincidence that this factory update landed right alongside Starship Flight 10, and notably, that flight deployed mock Starlink simulators. It was essentially a dress rehearsal. A dry run. Exactly. A dry run for massive, large-batch Starlink deployments once Starship becomes fully operational for payloads. Especially for the bigger V2 hardware, which needs Starship's lift capacity. We've seen Falcon 9's incredible cadence. It's a real workhorse. Right. But you mentioned Starship is key for these next-gen satellites. Can you elaborate a bit? How does Starship's capability fundamentally change the game for deployment, especially for those larger V2s, compared to Falcon 9? It really sounds like Falcon 9 is handling the load now, but Starship is poised to just blow it wide open. Absolutely. Starship's sheer volume and its payload capacity to orbit those are the game changers. While Falcon 9 is great for deploying batches of, say, 20-odd V2 mini satellites, Starship is designed to carry maybe hundreds of the larger, much more capable full-size V2 satellites all at once. Hundreds per launch. Potentially, yes, that's the target. So this means not only a massive increase in the number of satellites launched per mission, but also, critically, a significant reduction in the per-satellite launch cost. That kind of efficiency is absolutely essential for deploying the full, much denser constellation that Starlink envisions, especially as they look towards more bandwidth-hungry services and achieving truly global, seamless coverage. Starship really is the key to unlocking the full vision, that ubiquitous high-capacity network. So we're trying to connect all these dots looking at the bigger picture. I see three key strategic implications emerging from everything we've discussed. First, it's all about cost, scale, and building a moat. Moving to these standardized high-throughput build lines drastically reduces the unit cost per satellite and per terminal, and it compresses their iteration cycles they can design, build, test, and deploy faster. This just reinforces SpaceX's, frankly, undeniable cost advantage over any rival constellation trying to get started in low Earth orbit. That 70 satellite per week rate plus the 70,000 kits per week that represents a manufacturing velocity that's incredibly difficult for anyone else to match without similar vertical integration and, let's face it, massive capital investment. Okay, when you say incredibly difficult to match, what are we really talking about? Is this just a couple of years lead time? Or is it something more fundamental about their approach that could take competitors a decade or more to even try and replicate? I'd argue it's more fundamental, extending beyond just a few years. Mm. It's not just about the specific tech, though that's part of it. It's the culture they build over decades. Rapid iteration, failing fast, mm -hmm. vertical integration. And that's coupled with the huge capital expenditure on these highly automated factories. Replicating that wouldn't just require immense funding. It would need a complete overhaul of how traditional aerospace manufacturing usually works, which is typically much slower, more uh, bespoke. Right, less mass production focused. Exactly. So this manufacturing muscle, it really creates a significant and likely enduring competitive barrier, a real moat. Second key implication. This introduces network effects, but now in space. By potentially selling or licensing these mini laser links, 
enabling third-party satellites and even space stations to peer into the Starlink network. Well, SpaceX could extend its role way beyond just being an ISP. It positions Starlink as that foundational in-space backbone provider. This creates network effects just like we see with terrestrial internet carriers. The more nodes connect, the more valuable the entire network becomes for everybody on it. This could genuinely make Starlink the indispensable interconnectivity layer in orbit, changing how all space assets communicate. That's a powerful concept. But if Starlink does become this indispensable layer, what are the potential competitive ripple effects? For other satellite operators, say, who don't or can't plug into this system, does it sort of create a have and have not situation up there? Or does it maybe push everyone towards adopting a common standard, perhaps SpaceX's standard? That's a really critical question and yeah. probably one of the big debates for the coming years. It certainly creates a strong incentive for others to connect. I mean, if your satellite can suddenly access a high-speed global network with relatively minimal onboard hardware addition, that's a massive operational advantage. Yeah, absolutely. Those who choose not to, or perhaps are locked into different architectures, might find themselves at a disadvantage. Lower speeds, higher latency, maybe less operational flexibility. So, yeah, it could indeed push for a de facto standard, much like TCPIP became the standard for the terrestrial Internet. It could compel wider adoption, just for the sake of interoperability and getting access to this increasingly robust backbone. And the third implication ties into that. This opens up vast downstream markets. Think beyond just consumer broadband. High reliability backhaul for other communication services, rapid disaster response in areas cut off from ground networks, critical comms for mobility sectors like aviation and maritime shipping, mm. and even the direct-to-sell pilots they're actively working on with carriers now. Mm. All these areas benefit immensely from denser coverage and that robust inter-satellite routing that an expanded Starlink network, especially one with third-party integration, can provide. It's like building the foundational utility that will enable a whole host of new services and maybe even entirely new space-based industries. Could you maybe give us a quick concrete example? Like, how might this impact something like disaster response on the ground? What does that look like? Sure. Imagine a major earthquake or hurricane hits a remote region, completely wiping out power and cell towers. Terrestrial communication is gone. Now, if a disaster relief drone or maybe a mobile emergency communications unit can deploy quickly and instantly link into Starlink's in-space backbone, maybe using one of these mini lasers or a compatible terminal, they immediately have high bandwidth connectivity for sending back damage assessments, coordinating rescue efforts, providing a Wi-Fi hotspot for survivors, all bypassing the need for any local ground infrastructure. It could drastically reduce the time and complexity of establishing those vital communication links when every second really counts. Okay, that makes it very tangible. This vision of a ubiquitous space backbone is undeniably ambitious, maybe even revolutionary. But, you know, with such groundbreaking ambition usually come inherent complexities, risks, potential pitfalls. What are some of the critical considerations or open questions we should be thinking about as these advancements unfold? Yeah, absolutely. No free lunch here. This definitely raises some important questions, both technical and uh, geopolitical. For example, spectrum and policy. Having different constellations talking to each other via lasers, this cross-constellation peering brings up significant interoperability questions. What standards do you use? And regulatory approaches differ hugely from country to country. SpaceX has started talking about selling the components, but things like service level agreements, data handling protocols, liability, formal standards will be absolutely crucial for widespread adoption. You can imagine the complexities around, say, data sovereignty or who's responsible if a link drops crucial information. Right. So specific policy hurdles could be anything from defining the legal jurisdiction of data that's bouncing between satellites owned by different companies from different countries, maybe mm -hmm. ensuring fair access so it doesn't become a closed club. Precisely. It's uncharted territory for regulators. Then there's the ongoing issue of space sustainability. As production ramps up and launch cadence climbs even higher, especially with Starship, concerns about orbital debris mitigation and the impact on ground-based astronomy remain very much under the spotlight. Now, SpaceX has published mitigation steps. They talk about autonomous deorbiting, darkening satellites. Mm -hmm. But scrutiny from the scientific community and other space operators definitely persists. It's a continuous balancing act between progress and, well, orbital responsibility. Mm -hmm. a, a necessary tension. And finally, looking forward, there's a significant Starship dependency. We touched on this. The truly massive satellite batches, especially the full-size V2 hardware and whatever comes next, Gen 3, perhaps they really lean heavily on Starship maturing and becoming reliable and routine. This introduces a timetable risk. 
If Starship faces further delays or reliability issues, it slows down the full realization of the network's potential. Though, as he said, it's partly hedged by continuing Falcon 9 deployments for the current V2 minis. Right, so Starship isn't just about launching more stuff cheaper. Its actual operational schedule and reliability directly gate the pace and the ultimate scale of this whole Starlink expansion. That makes perfect sense. Okay. So given all this the potential, the risks, the dependencies, what should we as observers really be watching for, say, in the next 6 to 12 months? What are the key indicators of where this is all heading? I think there are a few key things. We should definitely look for more concrete details on the mini laser. What are its final verified performance specs? What specific standards will it adhere to for that third party integration? And crucially, who are the first announced customers? Beyond, you know, potential internal SpaceX programs, seeing who signs up first would be very telling. Also, keep an eye on those Bastrop expansion milestones. Are they hitting their targets? And maybe any subtle shifts in their in-house capabilities. Are they bringing more component production, like for PCBs or antennas, fully in-house? Because that would improve costs and resilience. Exactly. Bringing more of that production under their own roof drives down the build materials cost further and makes their supply chain more resilient to external shocks. Tighter control. Crucially, of course, we'll be watching for Starship payload demonstrations, actual satellite deployments from Starship, not just mock-ups, and any hard data on what that does to the per-satellite launch cost curve to really bend the curve as dramatically as promised. And finally, watch the scaling of direct-to-sell, more launches carrying those specialized payloads, and any early service indicators or announcements with major telecom carriers around the globe, that's another huge potential market opening up. Okay, lots to track. From the incredible manufacturing lines cranking out satellites and terminals to this visionary mini laser potentially opening up space for everyone. This deep dive has really unpacked the layers of SpaceX's ambition. It's clear they're not just building an internet service, they're aiming to build an entirely new layer of space infrastructure. Yeah, and it really leaves us with a provocative question, doesn't it? If Starlink's laser network does become this ubiquitous in-space backbone, this sort of internet in the sky that enables any satellite or station to just plug in, how might that fundamentally change our whole understanding of space? Maybe shifting it from just a frontier to explore, towards being more like a utility, something integrated into our daily lives and economies. What completely new industries or capabilities might emerge when global, high-speed, in-space connectivity is just a given? That's definitely a thought to ponder as we continue to watch the skies. Thank you for joining us on this deep dive.